Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala was asked that how did you recognize Allah? How did you recognize Allah Almighty? And Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala said that I used to make a plan. I used to put everything together and there was no deficiency in the plan. There was no hole. There was no reason for that plan to break down. But right in front of me, I could see that that plan used to break down. And I realized from this that there is a supreme being over and above me and my capabilities that, it is, that is in absolute control. We have these chips inside us that if we don't control these emotions, then these emotions control us and we become embodiments of akhlaq e Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al kareem. Amma bad. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yasilli amri. Wahlu al uqdatan min lisani yafahu kauli. Kallahu ta'ala fil furqan al hamid. Amen al rasulu bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi wal mu'minun. كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير سورة بقرة verse 285 translation the messengers sorry the messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم believes in what has been sent down to him from his Lord. And so do the believers. Each one believes in Allah, his angels, his books, and his messengers. They say we make no distinction between one another of his messengers. And they say we hear and we obey. We seek your forgiveness, our Lord, and to you, is the return of all. Sadaqallahu uh, al-Azim. Under this verse, for the last many, many weeks, we have been discussing the articles of faith, the tenets of faith. And alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah Almighty, for the last one or two weeks, we have been discussing books, holy books, scriptures scrolls. In the last lesson, to the best of my uh, memory, uh, we were discussing the content that uh, the Sahaba, the predecessors found in the scrolls and the scriptures of Musa and Ibrahim. And why we are focusing upon the Suhuf of Ibrahim and Musa because Allah Almighty explicitly speaks about the suhuf of Musa and Ibrahim in Surah A'la. And we will speak about that later on as well, the last part of Surah Al-A'la. We made mention that Abu Dhar Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala and he asked the Nabi of Allah, he said, what is the content in the suhuf? of uh, uh, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and Nabi Akri Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam shed light and he said that there are parables, mithals, pieces of advice on how to manage time. You would remember we spoke about that. Then Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala an, he extended the discussion and he said, Ya Rasulullah, what is the content in the suhuf of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. And we made mention that as we all know, that as a Musa alayhi salatu wasalam received the entire book known as the Torah. But at the same time, the Quran makes mention that he received suhuf as well. So most probably, before receiving the entire divine book, he received scriptures or he received a scroll. 
and that's what Allah Almighty is referring to in Surah A'la, Surah number 87. Now, what is the content in the Suhuf of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam said that they contain lessons of wisdom. So there are many, many statements in the Suhuf of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, and in essence, all of them revolve around wisdom. And the first lesson of wisdom that Nabi Akri Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam made mention of in front of Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari, who is the transmitter of this hadith, is that I am surprised at the person who believes that he will certainly die and yet he lives happily. So this was one lesson of wisdom in the suhuf of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam that each person knows that one day this life is to end, yet he lives happily. Meaning that he lives in the deception of this world without preparing for death. Alhamdulillah, last night we had a very good program, Alhamdulillah, in which we spoke about certain things that we can do in terms of preparation to death. Number two, lesson of wisdom. I am surprised that the person who believes in divine destiny and yet he is despondent and aggrieved as we all know that believing in Allah Almighty and believing that Allah is the absolute and the only controller in this world we may think that we are in control but in reality the true controller of everyone everything is Allah Almighty so much so that Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala was asked that how did you recognize Allah? How did you recognize Allah Almighty? And Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala said that I used to make a plan. I used to put everything together and there was no deficiency in the plan. There was no hole. There was no reason for that plan to break down. But right in front of me, I could see that that plan used to break down. And I realized from this that there is a supreme being over and above me and my capabilities that, it is, that is in absolute control. So Allah Almighty says in the Suhuf of Musa that uh, Allah is very, very surprised, or that word is used, I am surprised, at the person who believes in divine destiny. We all believe in destiny. وَالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى That all good and all bad that we experience in life comes from Allah Almighty. When we study Surah Shu'ra, uh, Surah number 26, and I would like you when you go back home to study from verse number 86, 87 onwards, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam says, أَلَّذِي خَلَقَنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِينَ وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُطْعِمُنِي وَيَسْقِينَ Excuse me, وَإِذَا مَرِزْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ That Allah Almighty is the creator and He's the one that guides. Allah is the one that gives life and Allah is the one that takes life. 80-81 around that area of Surah Shura. And then Allah is, then I fall sick and Allah is the one that gives me cure. So everything that happens in life, may it be good according to us, may it be bad according to us, because I use the word according to us because everything is good. Everything comes from Allah Almighty and there's a reason why it comes. But everything that comes in our life comes by the approval of Allah, by the permission of Allah Almighty. And I read a very famous statement uh, that uh, if you really want to be happy in life, then submit your like and your will to the like and to the will of Allah Almighty. And once you submit your will and your like to the will and the like of Allah Almighty, then you should know that everything that happens in this world happens by your will and your like. Because your will and your like is in line with the will and like of Allah Almighty. Aapni chahat, Allah ki chahat ke andar daal do. Allah ki chahat ke saad laga do. And if we don't opt for that, and we try to live the life that we like without 
involving Allah's like in it. At the end of the day, only that is going to happen that is liked by Allah. And we're always going to become despondent. So whenever good or bad takes place in life, we know it comes from Allah Almighty. And just keep in mind at that moment, in a bubble of adversity or in a bubble of prosperity, we just need to know what is the rule that I need to hold on to in this domain and what is the rule that I need to hold on to in this domain. That's, and let that time pass. Pass, you know, time is the biggest healer. The movement of time is a teacher. It is an educator. The passing of time is a relief to the adversity that we are experiencing. So we need to understand that he is in control. Not me, not America, not the superpowers. Allah is in control. So try to please Allah. If we see something that is not in line with what we like, then there are two possibilities. Generally, there are two possibilities. That what I like is not good for me. Number two, that what I do not like that has come my way, I need to focus upon why. Why? For everything, there's a reason. Remember that. For everything, there's a reason. I eat food, the reason is hunger. I drink water, the reason is thirst. I fall asleep because I am tired. There's a suburb, there's a means. So if something happens in my life, that is disturbing. There has to be a reason. Why do we not link our condition, our circumstances that are outwardly unfavorable, not to reason? There has to be a reason. Allah has made it very, very clear. That whatever we see that is outwardly not favorable, it is because of our own doings. So connect it. Now Allah Almighty says in the Suhuf of Musa that uh, I am surprised that that person who believes in divine destiny and believing in divine destiny is an article of faith and yet he is despondent and aggrieved. Now it's human nature, it is natural to be aggrieved. What Allah Almighty is saying is to be aggrieved at such a high intense level where he cannot reconcile. He can't get out of it. As human beings we're going to be hurt by circumstances that we don't like. That's fair. That's no problem. But to be in a position where a person cannot reconcile with the circumstances that are not favorable mentally, intellectually, spiritually, this is a problem. I remember we used to have coffee around the corner and there was a person that used to come with a dog. Still comes with a dog. And he's holding on to this dog and it seems like his entire life revolves around this dog. And uh, we developed a friendship and he made mention that he has no life partner. So his wife, most probably, or girlfriend passed away. Allah give him happiness. And uh, he, uh, he knows that the only friend that he can have that is loyal is this dog. And he could not reconcile with the departure of his life partner. He couldn't reconcile with it. Because they had, he had no belief in Allah. No belief in life after death. Most probably he's an atheist. How would he reconcile? How could he reconcile? We know last night we had a program. A few beautiful brothers and sisters in our community lost their loved ones. But there's a very easy method to reconcile with the death of your loved ones. Because we know that we are going to meet once again. And where our loved ones are waiting for us, we are going to arrive there as well. That is all divine destiny. So we should 
being aggrieved, having huzan. The Prophet of Allah makes the dua, Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min al wal hazan. That Ya Allah, we seek refuge with you from grief, from sadness. That means it does strike us. A lot of people say there's no mental issues in the world. Muslim, this is wrong. To say that Muslims can't have mental issues, this is absolutely wrong. We need to accept this. There are conditions out there. And Muslims are not immune to these conditions because they are faith. These are physical problems. So we may have depression. Muslims can have depression. You can have depression. It doesn't make you a weaker mu'min. You can have depression. You can have anxiety. It doesn't make you a weaker Muslim. These are physical problems. Conditions. But we have the set of rules. We have a very sound base that will allow us to cope with it. Being struck by hum and huzan, depression, anxiety, this is part and parcel of life. But we need to know how to reconcile with it. And believing in divine destiny will allow us to overcome these conditions much better, much quicker than those people that don't believe in divine destiny. That's the only difference. Because sometimes I hear even imams giving talks that uh, depression is not in Islam. This is a wrong statement, a very, very wrong statement. So what do you say about that Muslim that is depressed? He's not a Muslim. And there's not one or two Muslims that are depressed. There's many men and women. So if you say that depression is not a part of Islam and you shouldn't be depressed, what do we say to that brother and sister that is struggling in life that is depressed? That's a human condition. That's why the Nabi of Allah made dua that Allah protect us from hum and huzn, sadness and grief. That means it is something that will take over a human being. But the only difference is we believe in divine destiny that thought will allow us to psycho psychologically, mentally, rationally settle down and that will trickle into our soul. And inshallah, we will overcome that in quick time in, in, in a better matter. That's it, nothing else. Number three, lesson of wisdom. I am surprised that the person who experiences the, the changes of life, the rise and fall of nations, and yet he is content with the world. And we see this. We see around us some people today in a different state, in a mighty state, and tomorrow they lose that might, they lose that state. Sometimes healthy, sometimes not healthy. The vicissitudes, the changes in life, the ups and the downs, the fall and the rise of nations. This is a mighty lesson for us. And it's happened to us. We've seen it in our life. Saddam Hussein. Gaddafi. We were in Hajj when they executed um, Saddam Hussein on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah. We were there in Hajj. A few years before that, what might what control? Now, I'm not speaking about he's good or bad. I'm not talking about that. But we've seen the fall of people. Gaddafi, the fall of this person. I'm not talking about them being good or bad or evil. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fall, the rise and the fall. I'm a sports person. Tiger Woods, the rise and then the fall. So we've seen so many. But it's a blind eye. We don't take lessons from all these examples that Allah surrounds us with. So Allah Almighty says in the Suhuf of Musa, I am surprised at the person who sees these changes in life and yet he is content with the world. What does that mean? That this world is not permanent. No stage of life is permanent. With every rose there's a thorn and with every thorn there's a rose. Aaj khushi hai, kal khushi nahi hai. Kal khushi nahi hai, parsu khushi hai. Today we are happy, tomorrow we may be aggrieved. The day following we may be happy and then we may be struck by another thorn. So how can we be content with a world that brings both to us? That's why true contentment is in a place where there is only, only pleasure. And that is Jannah. There's no other place. And then I am surprised that the person who believes in reckoning, that one day he's going to die and Allah Almighty is going to order him to stand up and yet he abandons good deeds. 
he knows that we all know we're going to die. And we all know that we're not going to leave this world with a dime. Thanks, Sinatra. I think when I was reading about him when he left, he left about $200 million. And there was an article that I read that uh, his children started to fight over the wealth before he could be buried into the grave. But no person from the time of Adam alayhi salatu salam till now has been buried with his wealth. Because everyone knows that where this person is going, even if that person does not believe in reckoning, he knows that where this person is, this wealth has no value. So we need to understand what has value in that life. And that's why Allah Almighty says, I'm surprised at the person who believes in reckoning. And yet he abandons good deeds. Now, listen. Sayyid, Sayyidina Abu Dal Ghaffari, after listening to all this, the content of Suhufi, Ibrahim, wa Musa, he says to the Prophet of Allah, anything from these scriptures that you've spoken about, you've shared so much with me in terms of the content of the Suhuf of Ibrahim and the Suhuf of Musa, alayhi salatu wasalam, has anything like this been revealed to you? As Abu Zar Ghifari says to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He replied in the affirmative, meaning yes. Yes, it has been revealed to me. And Hazrat Abu Zar Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala an, he asked, where? Aha, where in the Quran has something like this been spoken of? And Nabi Akrim Muhammad said, recite from verse 14 to 19 of this surah, Surah A'la. And that's what we're going to speak about today. To understand what is the beautiful message. All right? Of the verses from 14 to 19 of Surah A'la. Because these lessons of wisdom, these parables, educative parables, can be all found in these five, six verses. So what verses is Allah Almighty referring to through the Prophet of Allah? Qad aflaha man tazakka. Number one, Surah A'la. Qad aflaha man tazakka. Indeed, whosoever purifies himself shall achieve success. Now I'm going to ask you, and I want you to think about it. Listen to the word. Qad aflaha man and I want you to listen to this. Tazakka. Tazakka. It translates to purifying yourself. Is there any other place in the structure of worship where you use a word that is similar to tazakka? Say, zakat. Tazakka. Yeah? A similar word to tazakka that is used in the framework of ibadat is zakat. Now what is zakat? So if somebody was to ask you, of course it's one of the pillars of Islam, zakat. But zakat means giving 2.5% of your savings, excluding debts. 2.5% right? to the poor and the needy people. So the remaining wealth that stays with you becomes pure. That is zakat. So if that zakat is not separated from your wealth, your entire wealth becomes impure. Does it make sense? So to purify your wealth, you need to take 2.5% out. So think about it. A lot of people take zakat as a burden. If a person had a, you know, a boil and it's full of pus, you will go to the doctor and you will say, please cut this and remove the pus because it's impure. I need this impurity to be removed from my body. So the person that takes it out, the doctor, you beg him to take it out. You don't want that impurity to be there. So the doctor comes, he makes you know, an opening and all the pus comes out. You thank the doctor. And you never want to see that pus again. You throw it into the bin. I would like us to look at zakat like that. That that poor person that comes, he's your surgeon. You should be thanking him. 
that he has come to take your wealth, and that is 2.5%, to leave the remaining pure. That's why they say go out and search for the surgeon. I use the word surgeon. Go out and search for the surgeon, for the physician that will make a cut and take out the impurity of your wealth and allow the remaining body, body, the wealth, to be pure. What a beautiful example. Now, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى The Prophet of Allah is saying to Abu Zarqifari, this is the Qur'an speaking about those lessons of wisdom, educative parables, that first of all, purify yourself. Now, what do we purify ourselves from? Zakat is purification of wealth. Purification number one, remember this. The Qur'an says, so if somebody was to ask you, what are you purifying yourself from? Number one, from hypocrisy. And on the same level, kufr, denial. On the same level, polytheism. Shirk, kufr, nifaq. Shirk, kufr, nifaq. Purify yourself from that. Alhamdulillah. Summa alhamdulillah. Each one of us are purified from shirk. Each one of us are puri purified from kufr. And inshallah, each one of us are purified from nifaq. By the might, by the grace, by the permission of Allah Almighty. So the first level of purification, Alhamdulillah, has been achieved by each one of us. Remember that. And we should make a lot of shukr that Allah Almighty has granted us that kind of purification. The second kind of purification is the purification of character. Our character should be purified. There are two types of akhlaq. In simple, they call it akhlaq mahmuda, akhlaq hasana, akhlaq azim, and on the other side, akhlaq madhmuma, akhlaq radila, akhlaq khabitha. So good character, bad character, and that's what we're speaking about in our jumas for the last few months. That we have these bad, we have these chips inside us that if we don't control these emotions, then these emotions control us and we become embodiments of akhlaq e And we're speaking about uncontrollable anger, for example. Not controlling anger will make you a very, very bad person in terms of character. We need to control ourselves and be the viceroy of Allah Almighty where we are in control of our inner self. We do not allow our inner self. And this is purification. And this is one of the hardest purifications. If you think about it, if I was to put a question to you, Alhamdulillah, Sum Alhamdulillah, we are Muslims. We haven't committed kufr. We haven't committed shirk. Huh? We haven't committed nifaq. But is it hard? Not really. We're born Muslims. Or we are brought into the fold of Islam. But after that, it's not hard not to commit shirk. It's not hard to abstain from kufr. True. It's pretty easy for us. For us to commit shirk is hard. <laughs> you tell us, I'll give you a million dollars and we bow in front of the sun. Oof, we can't do it. Say a word of kufr or commit to kufr. It's very hard. So, alhamdulillah. But by the grace of Allah, alhamdulillah, committing shirk, committing kufr is hard. Staying on tawheed, monotheism is easy. But when it comes to akhlaq, purification of akhlaq, that is hard. Controlling our demons, controlling our inner self, being pleasant, being productive, being worthy of the Viceroy of Allah Almighty. These are things that are hard. So purification of character. And the last one is purification of wealth. This is قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى But listen to the next part from 14 to 19. Then Allah Almighty says, وَذَكَ رَسْمَ رَبِّهِ and remember the name of your Lord. When we study the Quran from cover to cover, cover to cover, we come to know that Allah Almighty does not allow us to exceed the boundaries. There's boundaries for everything. But in terms of His remembrance, there's no boundary. So if we go to Surah Ahzab, verse number 41, Allah Almighty says, Udhkurullah dhikran. That kathira, abundance, has not been used anywhere else. So Allah Almighty even said to the Sahaba 
all right, that Sahabi that tied his hair to a pole. So at night time he's praying tahajjud and when he used to drop, his hair used to be pulled. So he could wake up. So the Prophet of Allah came to know of this. He says, no, 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 don't do that. Untie yourself. When your body tells you to sleep, you need to sleep. Because your body has a right upon you. And your eyes have a right upon you. You need to give comfort to your body. So you can't exceed the boundaries. But when it comes to the remembrance of Allah Almighty, Allah Almighty says, remember Allah Almighty in abundance. Do more than what you can. Go beyond your capacity. Remembrance through action is perpetual and remembrance through speech should be perpetual as well. You should be an embodiment or we should be an embodiment of the remembrance of Allah Almighty. And this is وَذَكَرَسْمَ Rabbi, And then فَصَلَّى Then pray. And this praying is inclusive to compulsory and non-compulsory. I'm going to share a beautiful gift with you and I would like you to remember, especially the youngsters that are here. Allah reward all of you for praying. A lot of people are struggling to pray now. So you come and you pray your compulsory prayer. Before and after there are optional prayers. And many a times we say it's optional so we can let it go. Fair enough. At least the positive out of this is you're praying the compulsory. There's many that are not praying the compulsory. So the question that I want to pose to myself and to all that are listening, why are we praying? Because we love Him. We love Him. We want Him to love us as well. One way love doesn't work. It has to be a two way traffic. I love you, you love me. We love Allah, Allah loves us. So we need to do something extraordinary to attract his love. Because there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world and many of them pray the five daily prayers. So I'm going to give you an example. Remember this. This will encourage us to engage in optional prayers, optional deeds. Dr. Dawood Saab has a factory. He says, Imam Uzad, would you like to work for me? I said, yes. I say, how many hours? He says, from 8 to 5. What do I get paid? He said, you get paid $1,000 on Friday. Monday to Friday, 8 to 5. I said, right. It's not my factory. It's Dr. Dawood Bachelor's Saab's factory. I go there and start working. One day, Dr. Dawood Saab closes his office and it's 8 o'clock at night. He comes down and he sees all the lights are off. And all the workers that are paid $1,000 at the end of the week, they have left. And they have left at 5 o'clock. But Uzair Akbar, Imam Uzair Akbar is working still at 8 o'clock at night. Dr. Dawood Bachir will say, don't you know, Imam Uzair, that you are paid for so many hours a week? Why are you working extra? And you say, because I, w I love it. Because this factory is like my factory. I treat it as mine. And I do this because I love you. You're a good boss. Now, my relationship with Dr. Dawood Bachelor will be very different and his relationship with me will be very different than the relationship that he has with the other workers. The reason behind it is the other workers are doing good, but they're only doing that which is compulsory. But what I am doing is I am doing more than what is compulsory. So anytime a person commits to something that is optional, he develops a special relationship. So I say to all the youngsters that are here, from a very young age, the pre and the post prayers that are known as the sunnats, don't miss them. This is your showing to Allah Almighty that the discharging of the compulsory is not a burden. I like to do more. I love you so much that I would like to engage before the compulsory and I would like to engage with you after the compulsory. You will see that these optional Raka'at units will take you to heights that are beyond your imagination. And you will start to enjoy the, the, the worship, the ecstasy Allah Almighty will grant you. Right? And that's what Allah Almighty is saying. And then, this is very important. 
And this is in line with all the suhuf. Why can't we remember Allah Almighty in abundance and pray the compulsory and the non-compulsory? Many, many brothers, many, many sisters that we have in the Muslim world are negligent. They, the, the time passes and they don't make sajda. The time passes, they don't wake up. How many we know of our relatives, our loved ones, Allah give them hidayah. They have beautiful qualities, but there's something going wrong that they don't worship Allah Almighty. Allah Almighty says, Bal al The reason behind it is you prefer the life of this world. That's it. This is the deception. Try to look through this. Try to, and then Allah Almighty says, Wal akhiratu khayrun wa abqa. Although the hereafter is better and more lasting. It is human nature. Generally, something that is visible and readily available is given more importance than that that is invisible and not readily available. And that's why Allah Almighty says in Surah Dahar, and Surah Dahar is Surah number 76, and it is verse number 27. Verily, these believers, uh, sorry, these disbelievers love the present life of this world and put behind them a heavy day. The day of Akhirah, they put it behind. They don't think about it. Because whatever the Prophet speaks about, whatever the Quran speaks about, it is invisible and it's not readily available. And a person's nature, his make, is attracted to that that is visible and that is readily available. So we give preference to the dunya over the akhirah. That is human nature. We give preference to dunya over akhirah. Now, Allah Almighty says akhirah has a few characteristics. It may not be visible. It may not be readily available, but it has two characteristics. Khair, it is better than that that is visible, than that that is readily available, and it is durable. This is not to last. That's why in the suhuf of Musa and Ibrahim, what do they say? Changes. Life is a change. I'm going to share an example that my Sheikh has given Mufti Taqi Usmani Sab Damad Barakatum, and I would like you to remember this, especially the young ones. Lock this in your memory. I'm going to give you option, all right? Option number one. Option number one. There's this beautiful mention, beautiful mention. It has, let's say, 20 rooms, 10 bathrooms, swimming pool, everything that you dream of, this mention. And it's fully furnished. You can enter and start living in it. The person that gives you the keys, he says, look, this mention is yours. It's fully furnished. But there's one condition. I say, or we say, what is the condition for entry into this mansion? And the owner says, the condition is you can only stay in this mansion for one month. And after one month, you have to leave. You'll be kicked out. Then we say to the owner that is showing this mansion that is fully furnished, is there another proposition, another proposal? He says, yes. There's another proposal. He said, you see that house? Substandard house. Nothing like this mansion. And it is not furnished. It is not furnished. The walls are breaking. The fans are not working. The kitchen is old. There's damp in the rooms. Substandard but there's one thing about this house is that once you enter, it is yours. It will never be taken away from you. Never be taken away from you. The first is going to be taken away from you after one month. The second is never going to be taken away. But the first one is a mansion fully furnished. And the second one is a substandard house. But it comes with something. And that is ownership. Complete ownership. 
So the question is posed, a sensible person, would he opt for the first or the second? He will opt for the second. Because what will he do after one month? At least he has a roof over his head. Now this example, Mufti Taqi Usmani Saab Damat Barakatum says, it does not, even this example, a sensible person will opt for the letter, for the substandard house. But this example is not befitting the scenario that we face in terms of dunya compared with akhirah. Because Allah Almighty says what is not visible, what is not visible, number one, and not readily available, it is not substandard. It is khair, it is better. So we are living in a substandard house, not fully furnished. And what is awaiting is the mansion. That's why it's khayr, it is better. And it is fully furnished. How do we know that? Because this place is kulluman alayha fan. It is to perish. Ownership is going to be transferred from father to son, from husband to wife, from wife to husband, from parents to siblings, from siblings to uncles, whatever it may be. But the mention that is waiting is abqa, everlasting, durable. So if we go to the first example where we will give preference to a substandard house over a mansion because the substandard house is abqa, durable, and ownership is given to us, and ownership of the mansion is not given, what about the choice that we should make when we know that where we are going has two qualities, and that is it is better than where we are living, and it is durable. What a beautiful example by Mufti Taqi Usmani Saab Dhamad Barakat. Allah give him a long life and keep him above us as a source of guidance. Now these are the uh, words that I wanted to share. Now I'm going to end on less, you know, the, the last lesson of wisdom that we came across from the Suhuf of Musa. And then we're going to link the Prophet of Allah. So we've spoken about from the Quran. Eh? The Prophet of Allah said all this that we have shared Regarding the suhuf of Ibrahim and Musa, you can find in Surah A'la, Surah number 87 from verse number 14 to 19. The last lesson of wisdom was, I am surprised. Remember this, then we're going to the hadith. I am surprised at the person who believes in the reckoning of the hereafter and yet he abandons good deeds. What did the Prophet of Allah say? I'm going to read the words first for barakat and then translate them. This hadith has been uh, transmitted by Hazrat Amr radiallahu ta'ala an. أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خطب يوما فقال في خطبته ألا إن الدنيا عرض حاضر يأكل منها البر والفاجر ألا وإن الآخرة أجل صادق يقضي فيها ملك قادر ألا وإن الخير كله بحذافيره في الجنة ألا وإن الشر كله بحذافيره في النار ألا فعملوا وأنتم من الله على حضر واعلموا أنكم معروضون على أعمالكم فمن يعمل مثقال ذرة خيرا يرى ومن يعمل مثقال ذرة شرا يرى. These words are from the fountain of wisdom. These words are from the fountain of wisdom. نبي كريم محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. And listen to them because we're speaking about Allah is surprised in the suhuf of Musa. I'm surprised that a person who believes in reckoning in the hereafter yet he abandons good deeds. What does the Nabi of Allah say? One day the Nabi of Allah delivered a sermon saying, Behold, and I would like myself first and foremost and then all my beautiful brothers and sisters listening to visualize that the Nabi of Allah is directly speaking to you, you individual. The Prophet of Allah is saying, Behold, the world and its things are indeed a temporary commodity. Today it is, tomorrow it isn't. The world and its things are a temporary commodity and as such have no worth and value. Shared and consumed by both the pious and the impious people alike. We eat, non-believers do. We drink, non-believers do. We inhale and exhale, non-believers inhale and exhale. Whatever this dunya has to offer, good and bad both are consuming it. Indeed, the hereafter is truly a reality and will arrive at its appointed time in which judgment will be made by a powerful king. Then the Nabi of Allah says, Behold, the answer sunnah. 
give your undivided attention. Behold, listen carefully. Indeed, all good in its entirety is in paradise. Khayru wa abqa. Indeed, all evil in its entirety is in the fire. Whatever good we receive, it's nothing. It is partial because good in its entirety is in paradise. And all bad that we experience in this life is partial. It is not abqa, durable. Because evil in its entirety is in hellfire. Allah mahfazna min. Allah protect us from that. Understand well, do good deeds. With due fear of Allah Almighty. Meaning keep the intention well. And know that you will be confronted by your deeds. Every person is going to be confronted by his deeds. His deeds are going to be the reason why this person is going to be judged in a certain manner. Whosoever does a particle weight of good. Shall see it. And whosoever does a particle weight of evil shall see it. As a reference you can put it down. There are four places that I have found in the Quran where Allah Almighty speaks about the particle of weight. Right? Sakulat Mawadinu. So you go to Surah Mu'minun. So this is recorded, Surah number 23, verse 102. You can go to Surah Qari'ah, Surah number 101, verse number 6. You can go to Surah Zilzal, and that is Surah number 99. The last two verses, 7 and 8. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًا يَرَى And then you can go to Surah A'raf, Surah number 7, verse number 8 onwards, where Allah Almighty speaks about the mizan, the scale. وَالْوَزْنُ يَوْمَئِذٍ الْحَقِّ فَمَنْ ثَكُلَتْ مَوَاذِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Collect good deeds. Be a farmer of good deeds. Plant good deeds. Because whatever we plant here, my noble brothers and sisters, the harvest is on the other side. We will exactly see what we have harvested, what we have planted on the other side. Be good farmers. Allah Almighty has given us time. Allah Almighty has given us a body. Allah has given us aql, intellect. Allah has given us energy. Allah has given us ability. Allah has given us istita'at. Put all this to good use. We've only got one chance. We've only got one chance. I am 50 now, 51. I may have another 10, 20 years if I live that long, productive. After that, Buddha. I won't be able to pray Tajj. 20, 30 years. So whatever time we have now, Spend it towards good. I'm not saying live a boring life. Enjoy. Play sports. Do what you need to do. Be obedient to your parents. Listen to your elders. Take guidance from your elders. Be a comfort for the loved ones. Nowadays, my dear children, you have become a discomfort for your parents. Don't do that. Because what you're doing to your parents now is going to happen to you when you grow up. Remember that. Allah Almighty will not forget. Your parents may forget. You may forget. Allah will not forget. The witnesses around that are putting together all your good deeds and bad deeds, they will not forget. Don't forget the creative hands. Don't forget the Qudrat of Allah Almighty. Holidays are coming. Help your parents at home. Be a good brother to your young brothers. Be a good brother to your young sisters. Be a source of comfort. Let your siblings aspire to you. Be the one that changes the lives of others. Tell me this, my youngsters. To do what everyone is doing, everyone is giving hard times to their parents. Most of the children are doing that. What different are you doing? What makes you so special if you do exactly the same? If you want to be special, do that which the world is not doing. Do that with Allah wants. And it is a little bit of sacrifice. Because this time will return back to haunt you. This time will come back to haunt you. When you grow up, as you have made your parents cry, you will cry. I'm going to end on this very important. There was a person who was carrying his father. Allah Jalaluddin Rumi says he was carrying his father and his father was taking his last breaths. He was taken into the jungle and he was going to dump his father in the jungle. No janaza, nothing, no one there. 
The father says, son, can you just take me a little bit further and dump me further down? Dump me further down, not up here. He says, why? He says, because I dumped my father. He dumped his father there. His son is doing exactly the same to him. My dear youngsters, youth, for your sake, not our sake, for your future comfort, for your future success, be good children. Be obedient children to your parents. Don't bring a tear into their eyes. And you will see that the, all the sacrifices you make, because sometimes you have to close your mouth. You have to bite your tongue. You have to bite your ego. Right? It's a sacrifice. But all this sacrifice will come back to reward you. Inshallah, can we do that, youngsters? So you go back home. If your mom and dad is unhappy with you, go and hug mommy and daddy. Give them a kiss and say, mommy, daddy, forgive us. From now on, we are going to be children that are going to give you comfort. Allah Almighty grant all of us his love and Allah Almighty grant us success in both ways. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.